Daniel. I wanted to talk about why I think Buddhism is simple. I think that these days, a lot of people think Buddhism is really weird and really hard to understand and complicated. And I want to talk about how it can be and it should be. Maybe should is not the right word, but I'm going to talk about how it can be simple. So I hope this is helpful to you as we kind of navigate through Buddhism because it seems really weird a lot of the time and we have to be careful, especially if we're telling people about Buddhism, we're telling people that we're practicing or even if we're telling people that we're meditators, they could also, that's the same thing. That meditation is, is simple. It's about being here. It's about being present. But at the same time, we get really hung up on things that make it seem weird and complicated. And I think we're doing a disservice to potential meditators, potential Buddhists, and to ourselves if we aren't showing the same. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to read you a quote, and this is not a Buddhist quote, actually. It's from a Chinese philosopher who lived at the same time as the Buddha, almost, and his name's Confucius, and he said, life is simple, but we insist on making, making it complicated. Life is simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Um, another version of that by a Zen teacher named Mei Zen, she said, happiness is simple, but everything we do to try to get it is complicated. Happiness is simple, but everything we try to do to get it is complicated. So I'm going to talk about the Buddha and Buddhism and why I think Buddhism is simple. We think of the Buddha as this grand spiritual teacher, especially because so much time has passed. And even kind of right after he died, people started thinking of him as this really special being. But I picture the Buddha as a practical person, someone who's a lot more interested in what we can do in our lives than complicated teachings about time or reality or spirits or whatever else might distract us at times. The Buddha came up with this unique idea, the idea that the truth of suffering and how to overcome it. That's the idea he came up with. The idea is that we suffer because of craving. We suffer because we're attached to things all the time. We suffer because we sort of have an expectation from life. We're holding on to things, and that's why we suffer. And the Buddha was a great spiritual innovator his death, he was followed by a series of teachers who wanted to turn his ideas into a, a religion and a philosophy, a religion and a philosophy. And we still have that argument sometimes. People say, is Buddhism a religion or a philosophy? And the Buddha just said, I teach only suffering and the way out of suffering. And that's it, suffering and the way out of suffering. So if we're thinking about complicated philosophies and we're not thinking about suffering and the way out of suffering, then we can get off track sometimes. The Buddha was just encouraging people to find freedom and to experience life more fully by engaging in the present moment, by being mindful, by being here instead of being somewhere else all the time. A lot of times in life we're somewhere else and that doesn't serve us very well. And we can cultivate awareness and compassion. And it's the truth of these teachings of the Buddha that we're looking for. And they weren't always complicated like they are today. And they've become very complicated over the years. And people will debate subtle nuances of Buddhist doctrine or Buddhist history or all sorts of things. And we really, when we're, why are we debating? What is the point of that, right? It takes us, it makes it harder for people to engage Buddhism when they see Buddhists arguing about if, you know, it's sort of like um, when we hear about Christian philosophers debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Maybe we don't hear that now, but in ancient times, people argued about that. And that's, who cares? It's just, it's just nonsense. And it's one of those things where I guess we like, we like to find things... And it does us a disservice. I think when 
when people see Buddhists arguing whether spirits are real, I think that some people like that, but a lot of people are just shut down. They don't want anything to do with that kind of argument. They don't want to hear that. That's silly, and it's not worth our time. The truth is that the Buddha just encouraged us to face reality as it really is. That just facing reality, uh, trying to understand the world and our place in it, that's it. That's all we need to really do. Once in a while, there's a famous Buddhist teacher who comes along. Well, they become famous, but a Buddhist teacher comes along and they say, we're making this too complicated. We need to step back and go back to what the Buddha intended, which is a simpler teaching. And we can read their teachings and they can make a lot of sense to us. I'm thinking of Bodhidharma, who is the teacher who is said to have brought the Zen tradition to China. He traveled from India to China and he saw the Buddhists he saw around were not meditating. They were memorizing texts. They were sitting around having debates about subtle aspects of Buddhism. They were They were just chanting all the time. I think chanting is fine, but I think meditation is the cornerstone of Buddhism. I think meditation is really important. And Bodhidharma saw these people not doing it. They were not doing the practice of the Buddha, which was meditation practice. They just weren't doing that. So he sort of created the Zen tradition. Zen means meditation. He created this tradition of what were called those guys over there who meditate. That's what it means when we say Zen Buddhist. It means those Buddhists who meditate, which now, of course, most Buddhists do meditate. But at that time, he ran into all these Buddhists who didn't even do the main practice of the Buddha. They had made Buddhism more complicated by adding all these things. And so this guy Bodhidharma, he just said, well, we don't, need we need to sit we don't need to do all that stuff we need to sit and actually those early zen buddhists some people thought they were really lazy because what did they do they just sat they just sat facing a wall facing a wall was bodhidharma's practice they just sat facing a wall and they didn't do these complicated debates they didn't make offerings to spirits that was another thing he saw buddhists doing making offerings to spirits they didn't do that they just sat they just sat and they thought about ways to support sitting practice and they talked about sitting practice and that was all they did and these other things can be a distraction sometimes and it can be hard for us to accept how simple things are too i can't tell you how many times that i have taught people how to meditate and after i've gone over the instructions A lot of people are like, that's it? They expect more. They expect, I don't know what they expect. They expect, maybe they expect me to give them a mantra sometimes or to really give a lot of guidance, which is not what I do. Because um, to me, meditation is really something you do. It's not something that we do. It's not really something I guide you in. It's just... I just create the space for people to do it. And it, I'm essentially selling water by the river because you can do it, at, anyone can do it at home, but without any guidance. But the fact of the matter is that most people won't, right? Most people need a space to be created for them to sit. It's something that I'm, I'm sitting and the person I'm sitting with is sitting, we're doing it sort of alone together because we're each doing it ourselves and nobody can do it for you and nobody can, yeah, nobody can do it for you. It's just something you're doing and it's just something I'm doing. The they There's a saying that teachers can point to the door, but they're not going to push you through it. They're not going to hold your hand when you walk through it. They're just going to and that's sort of what I'm talking about here. So people expect sometimes when they get meditation instruction, they expect something complicated or something weird. And 
what I teach is I teach them how to keep their back straight and I teach them what to do with their hands and I teach them what to do with their eyes. And then I'm either doing breath counting. So I'm either teaching them, telling them how to count their breath, or I'm telling them how to just rest in the present moment and just be aware of what's happening and do nothing else, not even count the breath. And for some reason, people expect complication and they expect something different sometimes. So when I give instruction, I just say, okay, we're going to sit and I like to put my legs in half lotus, but you can do whatever you want with your legs. Just make sure they're not going to distract you and your feet aren't going to fall asleep. And I like to put my hands in the cosmic mudra, which is like making a little bowl and resting it in my lap. And I think that's a good thing to do with your hands. And I also think, think the relaxation mudra, which is just hands on knees. I think that's good too. And once in a while, I'll do that one. And the most important thing is to keep your back straight because if you start to slouch, your mind starts to wander. It happens. It always happens to me. I'm told by a lot of people that it happens every time. And I don't know what people are expecting, but it happens uh, when I give these teachings. It happens uh, maybe once every 10 or so people I talk to, they're like, isn't there more? And... There's not more, not the way I do it. We're just, we're just doing our sitting practice and we're thinking about ways to support our sitting practice and that's it. And maybe in our day-to-day -day life, we're trying to think of ways to be more compassionate and ways we can be better at paying attention, but the practice itself, we're just gonna sit and we're either gonna use the breath as an anchor or we're not, but those are really the only two things we may, there are occasionally there's a more complicated practice that I give, but this is um, very rare. I wouldn't give it to a group. And that's just the Huato, the uh, self-inquiry practice where you ask yourself a question over and over. You say, who am I? You just reflect on that question and you try to figure out who you are, but that's, um, that's a one-to-one. -one. That's a teaching I give to one student and we talk about it rather than a group practice. So in group practice, all I'm doing is telling people how to arrange their body and that's it. It's the practice that comes from the body. We think of, sometimes we think of the body and mind as separate, but they're not. And that's why sometimes we think about following the breath because when you get really nervous or really upset or anxious or angry, you breathe faster. That is a really big reminder that the body and mind are not separate, right? What's going on in your mind changes your breathing. And also there are things like sweating when you're nervous, right? Hearts racing, right? There are all sorts of ways we could probably think of that the body and mind are connected. So to think of those as separate, I don't know where we got the idea that the body and mind are separate, but they're not. And our meditation kind of can remind us of that. I feel like I've rambled a bit here, but um, this is why I think Buddhism is simple. I think that things have been added to Buddhism over the years that are supposed to help. And maybe at a certain time and place they did help, and maybe sometimes they help now, but we need to not lose what we're talking about. We need to not get distracted forget about the forest because we're distracted by the trees, right? So we need to remember Buddhism is simple. We want to be more fully present and aware. We want to live more awakened lives and we need to just have a sitting practice. So um, thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Have a great day.